Okay, welcome to our newest edition of our BDPA Tech and Career Talks. I'm Devin Jenkins, our National BDPA Tech and Career Talk leader. Uh, glad to have Ray with us today. Uh, we, we both are at GE Healthcare, actually. I am a technical product manager in our supply chain uh, digital technology space focused around our analytics. Uh, but uh, Ray is also here uh, as a professor at Concordia University in Parkside, Wisconsin. Uh, he's doing some great work there, and I'll let him tell you more about that here shortly. Uh, but for, before we get started, I just wanted to give a brief overview of BDPA as well as the tech talks for those who may be new here. Uh, our BDPA is Black Data Processing Associates, uh, been around since 1975, uh, so over 40 years in the game here, uh, building uh, the talent pipeline for young people around the computer and technology space. Uh, we have annual composition where, where those students uh, compete um, in computer programming prompts and build databases and things along those lines with other students from across the country. So we develop computer programming skills and middle and high school students. And then it's also a form for professionals in the IT space to continue to develop their skills. And our mantra is take advancing class, advancing careers from the classroom to the boardroom. Uh, so that's what BDPA is all about. Uh, I would also be remiss if I don't take the time to uh, acknowledge and honor our uh, co-founder, Mr. Earl Pace, who passed away recently. Uh, his homegoing service will be held tomorrow. Uh, there is a Zoom link and will be a BDPA tribute at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so if you uh, follow the BDPA social media pages or are in the email list, uh, you should have that information. So definitely encourage you to join tomorrow as we honor our co-founder, Mr. Earl Pace. Uh, as far as the Tech Talks go, these are held on the second and fourth Friday of each month. We have a range of speakers speaking on different topics, uh, so you never know what you'll get when you come to these, but it's always a good time. It's informative and insightful. So that's my spiel for today. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Ray uh, to give you a deeper introduction of himself and get into his spiel for today. Uh, continue to leverage the chat with your questions, your comments throughout um, right now, I have it so that um, everyone is muted. There will be times where Ray may open the floor for questions and I'll allow you to unmute. And then we'll also dedicate time at the end for open Q&A and discussion. So thank you for joining and Ray, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so thank you for being here today. And today, let's just jump right into it because we have a lot going on. Uh, the topic today is data theory. And let's add the word data strategy as well. So, I'm still figuring out a change slide. Ah, there we go. Okay, so some slight, um, just some slight clarifications here. Um, I am ex military, is where I started my professional career. Um, got out of the military in 2010. From there, I went into the world of analytics and investment. Um, and that took me uh, both education wise and professionally uh, all across the great state of Wisconsin primarily. Uh, from there, however, I did move on to General Electric Healthcare. It's one of my um, earlier uh, engagements uh, corporate-wise. Uh, that would include uh, other places like Johnson & Johnson. Uh, but I do want to clarify something here. I currently do not have and never have had an, any um, a relationship with a Concordian University. So everything that you're about to see here today is working in conjunction with the University of Wisconsin Parkside. They actually have a smart city policy and civic partnership innovation center. There, I, um, I've been working with some amazing faculty and developing this idea of data theory and data strategy. Um, moving on from there, uh, my wife is also there. She is the chief information officer there at UW Parkside, and she's also a professor in project management. Uh, we have four children, three boys, and our youngest, our daughter. We call her our freedom baby because she was born on Juneteenth. So with all that being said, let's jump into it. So our agenda today, we're gonna to first talk about the what's. What are data strategy and data theory? From there, we're gonna move forward to how do we data theory and data strategy? What do we get from data theory? And what do we get from data strategy will be our final part. And no, that's not a typo in the middle. The idea that we wanna start with here is that Everything should be verbed. It should be put in verb form. If we can't put it in verb form, meaning we can't apply it, 
What are we even doing? So what are data theory and data strategy? This is a great um, quote I found when I first started getting into system design analysis, education and studies. Um, and while I normally don't do this, I'm gonna break one of my rules here. And I'm gonna read you what you see on the slide. You think that because you understand one, that you must therefore understand two, because one and one makes two. But you forget you must also understand and. So let's define the current situation. And you, I'm kind of already giving it away with a plethora of words and a paucity of meaning. I'm arguing that regardless of where you're from, regardless of who you're, uh, where you work, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, I'm about to tell you your situation like a tarot card reader. So the not so secret secret, we're using a lot of terms, a lot of words, but nobody knows what they actually mean. What do I mean when I say that? I am not in I'm not attacking anyone's acumen at the personal level. I'm saying that when you're in a room with four or five people and you start using all the buzzword terms, data-driven, data analytics versus data science, um, big data. If I freeze that room at that moment and ask everybody to write down the definition of the word that was just used or the term that was just used, do you have confidence that everyone's definition would match or even half of them would match? That is the not so secret secret. We're using these concepts and ideas that are supposed to be helping us do our better, our jobs faster, better, more consistently. But in actuality, it makes things more difficult. We spend more of our time asking each other, what do you mean when you say that? What this is a result of, when we start talking about where we're at, we don't actually know. Because while we're in the same forest, we're looking at this, we're looking at different trees. So when someone radios in asking us, where are we at in the forest? We might be standing in the same place, but we're all facing different directions, giving different descriptions to the people who are trying to find us. So that's why that's marked in red. Therefore, we think we know where we want to go. So um, you probably hear very great visioning, very concept, very beautiful concept presentations from your leaders. But in all honesty, after the hype subsides, no one has any clue how to actually get there. So here's the purpose of data theory and data strategy. If it works, the end state is we know where we are at. We do know where we want to go and we do have an idea how to get there. I don't think anything I just said is new or groundbreaking, but this is the situation right now. What you end up having is what I call a reactive innovation approach. Everyone would say, yeah, we get this. But what does it mean when I say reactive innovation approach? I'm arguing that we all know there's a space between these two, this current state and this near future state. We don't talk about it, but we know there's a huge gap between them. There's something missing. Let's talk about what is not inside that box where we say something's missing, that in between. What's not in there is demanding innovation. No matter how much you're the authority, no matter how much you're the boss, you're not going to authoritatively demand innovation in the habits. At the middle management level, I don't care how long you've been doing project management, you're not going to PM your way through this. Going to the design teams and saying, how much time and research do you need to be innovative? That's not how it works. That's the equivalent of asking somebody who's about to cross a desert that to our knowledge, no one has crossed before. You're asking them up front to tell you how long they're gonna to take to cross the desert. Hands-free visioning. 
this is when I was younger in my marriage, a good example. I used to tell people that, you know, my wife, I let her handle the money. I used to say that like I was a progressive, empowering husband. In actuality, what I was saying was, I make it her responsibility to figure it out. That's hands-free visioning. You're just hoping it works out or you're placing the full responsibility on someone else. And finally, doing the same thing, but more. So you're, you may be seeing the same type of initiative that was tried five years ago or 10 years ago. It's like, okay, yeah, it didn't work then, but we just didn't have enough resourcing. So the idea is let's just do it harder, even though it didn't work before and there was no indication that we fell by magnitudes. And you see the bottom there. The want behind these activities is not the problem. Your want, your message, whatever you're trying to accomplish, that is valid. That's where data strategy and data theory comes in. Data theory, as you see, it connects underneath your current state and it takes you across your near future. And in data strategy is that, that how-to piece connecting the two. Coming back to that message, that thing you're trying to accomplish, instead of starting with your message, data theory and data strategy combined takes the idea of, hey, before we jump into this, why don't we all learn a common language, which therefore results in us getting a common culture. And then once we have that common language and culture, now let's try to put our messages out in that common language, given that common culture. So, Let's just jump right into it. Think about the terms I mentioned before. I'm asking, are they operable applications? Are they things you can use? Or I'm kind of being cheeky here. Are they onomatopoeia? They're just fun things to say. So fast and furious. Now for the record, these are some of the best definitions that I found and these are the ones that I've adopted. Um, but I wanna say this up front. The correct answer is whatever your entire team agrees on. So let's go with it. Big data, fast and furious. I've heard many definitions, but I got this one from Google. It's the best definition I've ever seen. Big data is just that computer sitting on your desktop, but bigger. They got a nice little acronym there to remember it, Loch Ness Monster, you can remember that. But it's just a computer, but bigger. That is big data, straight, simple. So when I speak with people and I'm talking about big data and I use that term, these are the topics I'm talking about, nothing more, nothing less. Data scientists. This is one I often open conversations with when people ask me what data theory is about. Imagine going to a cocktail party, you ask somebody what they do for a living and they tell you they're a doctor. A common response is cool, what kind of doctor? Here's the problem with the um, field of data science. We don't yet have that definitive terminology to ask that follow-on question. If a person right now, right now, when I tell someone I'm a data scientist, more often than not, I get asked, what is a data scientist? If the person has heard the term before, they, they don't ask what kind, they just ask what I'm working on. This is something where your organization does not have to wait for the world to come up with the answer to this. Within your organization, you can start saying, what kinds of data scientists you have. As you start working down an exercise, as you see on this slide, you're gonna quickly find out, I hope, what I found out. Everyone is a data scientist. It's just a matter of what kind. Digital transformation, the big term. As a data scientist, whether it's um, a project at work or um, a side consulting project here in my community, it's always started with, okay, we heard you guys do magic. We brought you in on a Monday. We want you to fix everything by Wednesday. But while I'm focusing on data science, honestly, this applies to anything within the data technology or, an or analytics space. All of you in the IT side, you feel the same pain, engineering, it's all the same. But you come in, they're like, we want you to fix things. We want you to make money. We want you to win games. Another analogy for you, that's the equivalent of hiring a head coach for a team, for a professional sports team, and telling them that the only thing you want them to talk about is championship games. In order for a 
head coach to get to championship games and win championship games, you need to give them access to the entire ecosystem of that team, of the entire franchise. So for a team to get to championship games, they need access to the recruiting pipeline. They need access to the other coaches. They need access to the people who basically keep these players out of trouble, helps guide them and mature and grow. Data is very much the same. It's not that you can't do any data science or analytics or technology solutioning, um, only focusing on the solution, but you're going to find a low level of efficiency between the amount of resourcing you put in and the results that you get out. If your team is not actively aware of this larger scope of knowledge areas, this is taken from the data management body of knowledge. This is an international um, institution. You can find it online. They have a book called the Dhamma Dimbak. And these are their 23 knowledge areas. I, to this day, am amazed how few people know or are aware of this. What you see here very quickly is you have this entire ecosystem of knowledge areas and data that you can figure out to where are you talking about and where are you going? We're going to come back to this. Digital transformation process. There's actually, you can think of it as three areas. The first being a data foundation management. The second being internal efficiency building. And then the last part being a customer or client facing value overview. Coming back to that slide we just looked at, I'm now overlapped that red, yellow, green across this. What, you're, what I'm quickly communicating here is that data governance planning and design and foundational activities in red, that should all be considered the foundation first. Once you have that foundation, you can build on top of it, your enable and maintain there in my yellow orange there. And you see in there, big data storage, data hardware, uh, data warehousing in 913. And then, and only after that, if you're being strategic in your plays, do you see the green? Uh, at the very top of you, think of your pyramid of your business intelligence, your data science, and of course, your data monetization and your master data usage. Another quick view to utilize this thing, I've color coded it, same view, but think of blue as while we all work together as a team in our organizations and our projects, think of the blue part as the items that maybe the business side of the house should be taking more of a lead on. Think of our, I'm gonna call that color fuchsia today. Think of our fuchsia color as where maybe data engineering should be taking more of a lead. Again, we're all working together, but who should be the thought leader or the leader in that area? And then finally, green areas, um, maybe an idea of who should be taking the lead for those areas, from data visualization to business intelligence to data science. Now, again, remember, these are not hard and fast rules. This is, um, my presentation and my ideas of where you should start. But again, the correct answer is whatever your organization decides. This should be familiar. This is taken from uh, Mackenzie Gartner. Um, and what I've done is I've overlaid with the red, yellow, green, their uh, data value chain chart that they have available. So we took the existing chart but going from raw data to integrated data all the way down the land of opportunities, we overlaid it with that uh, digital transformation at the bottom there from data management through internal efficiency to customer facing value. What I hope is coming alive here is you're now not just having charts and ideas and terms, you're now building a language, an ecosystem to actually navigate. So ultimately, Data foundation management, that's how do we talk data and analytics? How do we talk technology? How do we talk solutioning? Internal efficiency building, how do we assist data and analytical initiatives? How do we assist technology and software solutioning? And then finally, that customer or client facing value, how do we do it? How do we talk it? How do we assist it? How do we do it? What I hope is coming through here is that while we're talking about the latest technology to software, the conversations of build versus buy, ultimately a digital transformation initiative 
It's a change management initiative. It's about the people. And that honestly is the biggest blind spot we find. Data serves humans. We do not serve the data. Data is not new. That first cave painting on a cave wall, that was datafication. We do data for reasons. So data driven, fast and furious. You've heard this term, but this is an attempt to actually bring application to it. So we have a three level framework we've designed where level one is data driven. And a data driven item has three components. It engages one question. You have one place to go to for that answer, for that answer to that question. And that one place is widely known. The easiest one I can think of is a globe. You might not know where the Maldives Islands are, but if you want to find out, you know you can go to a globe of the Earth. And you also know that if you spin it long enough, you should be able to find it. Another example is a thermostat. You've never been to my house before, but if I ask you what is the temperature, you don't start giving your opinion on whether it's hot or cold. You know to go to a thermostat and you even know at what eye level, first you know to go look at a wall, unless I live in a very small apartment in New York that it might be in the closet. But at a normal place, you know to go look at the wall and you also know that it's gonna be at a certain eye level. It's more than likely not gonna be on the floor and it's not gonna be at the top of the ceiling in the corner. Those are data-driven examples. Data informed, fast and furious, this is whenever you have a solutioning where you ask more than one place for the answer. So let's say you are the boss at the company and you have a board and you ask your board a question. If you're not just asking one person, you're getting input from everyone to make your decision, that is a data-informed approach. So whether you're talking to humans or whether you go to several um, computer systems, you use several applications before you make a decision or to get an answer, that is data informed. You're going to more than one place to get the answer. Then finally, data aware. The biggest characteristic of a data aware solution is that you have to build the thing that gives you the answers. So let's say you want um, to calculate your GPA given the syllabus that the teacher handed out. If you go and build an Excel sheet, that is you punch in your grades, it gives you the uh, overall general, general grade, that was a data aware solution. The first time you built it, it was data aware. Now, if it gets adopted by other people and everyone uses it and that's the only thing they use, guess what? That's now data driven. If it becomes policy to use it. So a quick review here, data-driven, you can take the idea that it's one question, one source, one location. Data-informed, two or more sources. Data-aware, you have to build the location before you begin. So quick question you can put in the chat there, which level can best be described as consensus? See if I see any answers get thrown in there. Okay, so I saw some right answers, so I'm going to go ahead and show it. Answer C. You're taking a consensus, remember, for data informed. Remember for A, data-driven is not a consensus. You're going to one place. So again, when you go look at the thermostat, you don't, you don't see it says 78 degrees and you say, I don't trust the thermostat. And then you ask someone in the house how many degrees it is. You've never done that. <laughs> it might be broken, but you don't ask them if they think it's 74 degrees and then you pull their opinion and you take the average. That's a data-driven solution. One place, one location, one source. Data aware, you have to build 
the thing that gives you the answer. Data informed, you're collection, collecting information from several places. Try to repeat of that one there, sorry. So we just did a crash course on language and culture. So now let's get started, but how do we get started? And I'm attributing that quote to you and you know it. Levels to a conversation. There's the conceptual level, the business level, and the technical level. Whenever you're starting out on a project, especially an innovation project, I always see a red flag when on day one, we start talking about R versus Python, Shiny versus Spotfire, this vendor versus that vendor. I don't know what we care about. I don't know what we're trying to achieve. Start at the conceptual alignment. We care about ending world hunger. We care about um, bringing Wi-Fi connectivity to rural areas. What is the conceptual thing we're trying to do? Once I have that, and I'll say it differently, once your very smart, intelligent people have that, they can now drill down and build metrics that align to that. So let's say, for example, you're like, hey, we want to fight food deserts. We care about no one going to sleep, not hungry. Once you have that conceptual marching order and you have the rules of how you measure that, now your people can build sensors and metrics on their work, on their machines, on their tools to, make, to kind of measure how well we're doing there. And after that, we can then talk about tools. I can't compare R versus Python if I don't know what R and Python are supposed to align to. If we're a general, if we're doing a text analytics or maybe takes cleansing and scraping, I personally like Python better. But if we're doing just hard high level statistics, R all day for me. I need to know what we're doing first before we start talking about tools. Now, remember we saw this earlier, our, now, our digital transformation knowledge areas. Imagine that we stack them in a single column, one under the other. Next, we took this idea of, um, I believe a lot of people have seen this, the six data processes. Um, you're going from governance and provenance to generation the collection and standardization, to aggregation, to analysis, to application. Whether you're an engineer writing a log in a machine or a data scientist, or you're the finance or HR house, all these buckets apply to you. So the idea is if you take these six data processes and you can see there, um, governance and provenance is really, what are the, what are the rules? And provenance is, how do you know you're following the rules? Generation is pretty straightforward, but it's more about, are there rules of designing data? Does, in your finance or HR house, do people get to make a new Excel sheet however they want every day, and you're just emailing them back and forth? Or do you have version control? Collection and standardization, those Excel sheets, are how do you collect them? Are they emailing them to you? Are they persisting them in a share drive? Or do you have a Kibana stack where you're collecting this information? Aggregation. How do you enrich the data? Now that you brought it in, how are you putting it to, uh, how are you synthesizing it into one? And then finally, and, and let me just touch back on aggregations because a lot of people ask what's there's between that and analysis. The big difference there is, um, are you combining the data at the state level or the national level? That's a good way to think of what we mean when we say enriching the data. Then finally, analysis, whether you're using computer or you and the other team is looking at the data yourself and making human inferences. How do you analyze it? And finally, how do you present it, deliver it, communicate it, act on it, maintain it, and even obsolete it? How do you decide when that data is no longer any good? Or are you thinking about the fact that data um, has a shelf life? Taking those, let's put those in a horizontal line those six we just talked about. Now, at this point, I sometimes get a little pushback where someone's like, Ray, you keep talking all this data and data science stuff. That previous slide you just showed, 
has nothing to do with my business. I've never seen these terms before. I don't do this. I'm going to say that business has not changed. At the end of the day, there's only three objects of concern in a business. There's people, there's your platform or process, and there's your product. At the same time, for, since man has been doing business, there's only seven things you're trying to optimize. Four of them tied to people. You see them there on the screen. You can have a thousand metrics for your business, how it's managed, how it's maintained, and they may be um, all needed, but I guarantee you they all roll up into revenues and expenses if they're specifically about the business itself. And then finally, product quality. I've been sharing this uh, conversation for over 10 years. And I've challenged anyone $1,000. If you can come up with an optimization interest for human beings that does not roll up into one or more of those seven categories. So the bounty's still out there for anyone interested. This is the foundation where we can say, assuming you don't have anything new, there is a holistic way of thinking about data, the reasons why we create it, use it, analyze it, and present it. So this is our next step. We're going to combine them. Again, we have our data knowledge areas, and just imagine all 23 are going down, and then we have our six processes going across the top. This is the beginning of us having a deliberate, proactive strategy, a strategic data heat map and matrix. This is now bringing us to now knowing what and means. Coming back to our slide before, data theory is the idea that there are rules that obey, that data obeys that are agnostic to business case or business use. That's really what we're saying here. We're saying it doesn't matter what your business case is. There are rules that data obeys. Those six data processes, those 23 knowledge areas. Leveraging it into work instructions, principles, we're calling that data strategy. And that is a collection of these methodologies and processes and frameworks that provide the how. How do we get from our current state to our near state situation? It comes ultimately to this. You and your team has a lot of ideas. You have to decide which ones you try to actually turn to a POC for innovation. And then you're hoping that you want them to get to the end state goal, commercialization, productization, delivery to the public for my nonprofits. The problem is moving down that delivery funnel, we have this inefficiency, loss of resources. If we, you try all these ideas, try to innovate them, but they don't all make it to the green finish line. The idea is that with data theory and data strategy, notice the red section did not get smaller. We're not trying to say no to ideas. We're saying you can use this as a tool to better manage what items move towards innovation and commercialization. Now, you saw the yellow part shrink, but you see a much smaller gap between yellow and green. We're, as I said before, we're not saying don't do those ideas in red. I like the Zig Ziglar quote. It's not a no, it's a not right now. Being methodical and strategic in how you engage your ideas all your ideas in the red may be great, but you may not be in a position to engage all of them right now. Engage them in the order where there's most likely success and allow them to build on each other. That is the idea of applying data theory and data strategy to your solution. So coming back to our agenda at the beginning, we basically overlay this idea of a digital transformation process where we now have a way for us to talk, even in this short amount of time, we can now even assist each other. And we walked away with a couple of tools at the end, our, our um, the strategic data heat map, for example. We now have ways to actually do data theory and data strategy for a forward-facing value. So in conclusion, words matter. 
data driven begins with us, our actions and our words. Data theory is the idea that data does have rules that it obeys. And those rules are agnostic to the business case. We focus a lot on the fact that data doesn't recognize business silos. This is engaging what does data obey? And at the end, we talk about how we can better manage and control that delivery funnel from idea to innovation to commercialization or productization. We touch on the fact that digital transformations are in fact change management projects. And um, if you saw some charts you like here, they will be made available for anyone who's interested. And I just wanna do a little final plug for the UW Parkside Smart City University Initiative. Um, there is a virtual certificate program. We are adding more classes, getting into this data theory and data strategy. It's ongoing right now. You can definitely check it out. And specifically um, for the Smart City Policy and Civic Partnership Certificate, that is a, it's designed for professionals and business folks and individuals um, interested in being a, uh, a leader, a thought leader and practitioner and the idea of what is a smart city? How do we smart city? So that was fast and furious. We can definitely go back to any slides, but questions. All right, everyone, I have just uh, gave you the ability to unmute yourself. So feel free to come off of mute um, and ask Ray any questions you may have. You can also drop your questions in the chat if you don't wish to come off mute, but the floor is open at this time. Good morning, good morning. Raymond Roberts, greetings to you. Yes, sir, how are we doing? Good, good. This is Sam Nixon, and thank you very much for walking us through the data, uh, the, the ways we can think of, of data there. Appreciate that. My, my, my question, in, in terms of not being a, a long-winded, self-indulged question, is, is, <laughs> <laughs> is um, how do we begin to um, help in terms of our young people uh, as they're growing up? How do we begin to maybe implant some of the ideas of what data is and how to use it so it becomes a part of our, uh, our thinking, I guess it is, uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, considering uh, data in the way that we, we live and use it in our, in our daily lives, because since it's a relatively new field compared to other fields, uh, how, do we, how would you suggest is a good way to start thinking about that? from the home perspective, as well as the education and school perspective. So is that showing here? Yep, I'm seeing the, the spreadsheet right now. Okay, so here's my argument. And again, you're, if you haven't figured it all right, I'm a bit of a philosopher. I argue that this data thing isn't new. The titles are new, data isn't new this need to do it isn't new. So starting with children, I would see they have an opportunity here because most people do think it's new. We can raise up a younger group of kids to see the reality that this is everywhere. How I mentioned that caveman drawing. A lot of people use the term data as if data didn't exist until after computers. I would ch I, I challenge kids, tell me what you care about. If it's basketball, you know, sports, video games, this all happens, even if that kid only cares about video games. Governance and providence. You know, nowadays, the kids are playing with each other remote, you know. There's rules to the game. Who decides the rules? How do you enforce the rules? Generation, the data that's being collected off the game, that's a big thing right now, privacy and security. Do I want you tracking how I play the game and use it? Collection and standardization. Who decides what... Um, are the best methods of navigating the game. You might not hit every box, but I say that that exercise can start as soon as your kids start telling you what they want for Christmas. I might not focus on the, the data foundation knowledge areas in the beginning, depending on the younger kids, but this here, this isn't data. This is life. This is everything in life. There is an opportunity for training up a generation that understands this and can go out into the workforce proselytizing this reality. 
I'm often in rooms where you're hiring all these data architects and uh, professionals with 15, 20 years experience, PhDs. And you know what I found? The projects still aren't getting done. Like that slide I showed you before with the gap. I have found no reason why you can't teach what I just taught the high schoolers. I can't found no reason which is why I'm at the university. Why can't we teach this to kids with bachelors? Because if you haven't seen it, it's there and you're gonna see it more. There's a role popping up, data strategist. You need people who are deliberately trained for data strategy. You might not see data theorists, but you will see data strategists. You will find places using the term data architect, um, but when you look at the taskings and expectations of the role, they're expecting you to be able to do these kinds of things. Um, to finish my answer to you, sir, uh, my favorite economist is Frederick Bastiat, 1840s. He wrote the statement that the problem with talking to most people about money is they think that because they've been holding it and touching it their whole life, they know about it. So basically, if a guy has been working at, you know, you know, as me, a guy's been a data scientist his whole life, he gets paid in money. He therefore thinks he knows about money. Would you hire me to be your financial advisor simply because I've been getting paid money my whole life? Of course not. Data is the same way. But if you look at our organizations, when we ask, why is that person in charge of the data initiative? Usually the answer boils down to, they've been touching data their whole life. Not that they specialize in data the way that a financial advisor specializes in money. We in our communities, we can start training this up. A generation, both us and them, a generation that knows the difference between getting paid data your whole life and being a data money manager. I see opportunities across all the different levels of education, honestly, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry. I appreciate that. That's a, that's a good uh, open challenge for us to move forward in. I see a question here in the chat. The certificate program, is it similar to the Google or IBM one? I have not taken them, I've researched them. So I'm going to say no. Okay. Sorry, that was my question. Oh, I'm sorry, no problem. <laughs> uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'm from the North Greenbush uh, site. Uh, I work for G Healthcare. Um, yeah, I came across the Google one and I actually signed up for it. So I'm in process of uh, going through that that course. Um, but one of the things when I first started, because I have a 14 year old and it seems very, I don't, won't say easy, but it it's very, you know, it's, it's uh, it doesn't seem too bad. And I was thinking about signing him up for it. So when someone brought up, uh, you know, are these topics good for the youth? Um, I, th I think it is a good idea for them to get involved as early as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. I say get involved early as possible. And again, as I said before, the data space, it's still wild, wild west. Think about medicine a hundred years ago where the doctor, he might've went to veterinarian school in your town. Now today, things are a lot more, let's say, stable. <laughs> um, unlikely the town veterinarian is delivering babies anymore. Data, yeah. however, is right now, let's just be honest. Anybody can wake up and say, I have a data management program. Schools are popping up left and right, turning out data scientists. There's no certification like engineering. Like you can't just wake up and say, I'm turning out engineers. If those kids can't pass certain certifications you're going to get found out. We don't have that in the data space. Um, so effectively, what I always ask people while you're navigating the wild, wild west, if you don't know upfront what you're going to be able to do with it, I argue that's a red flag as to whether you should be doing it. So everything that I design, everything I build, as soon as you're learning it, you can use it for something. It's so like this heat map you guys were just shown. You can now use this for scoping projects. When you're in a room, you can now say, okay, hey, we're talking about this project. We want end-to-end -end data connectivity. You could go through in real time and say, first off, we need some rules, everybody. We need some rules of how we're going to decide 
um, you know, what, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. Um, I was trying to highlight that, but for some reason, my version here is in protected view. I don't know how that happened. But imagine I highlighted that in green. You're now all looking at the same map. Because again, when you think about data conversations, it jumps all over the place. One minute you're talking about what metrics will we measure ourselves on. Next minute someone's asking, oh, should we use AWS or Azure? You can use it for scoping. You can use it for finding out, put your people, where their expertise out. See where you're strong, where you're weak. This is an example of, if you, it shouldn't just feel good. You shouldn't just learn cool terms. Can your people who build your content, who do the developing, your individual contributors, can they now build things, more of them, faster, more consistently? That's the test I always put to these type of conversations. So as you go through the class, that I say that's, I would recommend that's how you grade it. And if you feel that, yes, that's how it works, then ask, is it applicable specifically for your business case or across business cases? It's not bad if it only applies for yours. Um, and it's not bad even you have to do a little tweaking to it. But do you want to learn? I use the analogy of, think of the library. I only had to work, learn one Dewey Decimal System. After I learned that Dewey Decimal System, I never needed to know what books were in the library to use the library. When you're going across all these educations and these frameworks and these methodologies, do they, are they the Dewey Decimal System? Or do you have a library that has 17 different Dewey Decimal Systems and you have to read the book first to figure out which one it's using? How may we look up the YouTube recordings of this sessions? Um, yep. I'll that was above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I'll drop the link in the chat before we close out for our BDPA webpage. So they'll be linked on our webpage. That takes you directly to our YouTube channel. Um, if you look up BDPA on YouTube, you'll find our YouTube channel as well. I had a question. I had a question on it when you said uh, data has always been there. Um, do you think the thing that has improved is uh, data integrity? Data integrity? Absolutely not. Oh. What has improved oh. is our ability to persist it. Okay. How cheaply we can persist it. So don't hold me to exact numbers, but a megabyte of storage back in the 80s, that was a lot of money. Now I'm storing gigs and it's pennies. So that is what's changed. But let's talk about it. You're now able to store all the pictures and take them all you want at any given time. The facts are less than 2% of all the photos taken ever get looked at a second time. We're drowning under data deluge. And even the stuff we look at, we don't know how to look at all of it. That's why dashboard businesses are in such high demand. You have so much that you now store, you don't even know how to get a bird's eye view of it. But after you get that dashboard view, now you need to figure out how to do an analysis of that bigger picture. Which is why when you Google data theory or um, really the best stuff you're gonna find is coming out of a couple schoolhouses, but they're only teaching you section five, section four. They're only talking about exploratory data analysis and confirmatory data analysis. Here, at, here where we're working, we're taking the challenge of having the first holistic um, processes one through six of talking data theory and not just talking about how do you explore the data and how do you compare the data. And I should say they don't use the term, but under six, you have a lot of research in data visualization and communication that would fall under application. So, um, so there's, there's stuff out there as well. Tufty, I'll drop his name for anybody who's into that stuff. I'm a big follower of him. I will say though that one of the next big, one of the one of the big opportunity areas is data integrity or data quality, as you'll see it named here on that heat map. So you'll see at the bottom data risk management, metadata management at the bottom, and then in the middle lifecycle management, data integration and interoperability. 
master data usage, that all combines the data integrity. Think of the idea, the definition of data quality, which we do have um, a level 100 and level 200 um, education on that. Thank you. I see maybe time for one more question here. Oh, I, okay, I think I missed one. Are you finding that the line between IT and business data foundational areas becomes somewhat blurred as a reason why projects are not getting done? Um, I argue the lines were fake. This is responding to Valerie. Um, using another analogy, if you look at a map if you look at that globe and you look at Africa, the people who lived there did not draw those lines. Those lines were drawn by other people for other conceptual reasons. And the result was people that were friends and family are now separated by nations. And people that were enemies are now combined as a single unit, despite how they feel about the situation. I'm arguing that in business, their attempt to leverage how fast we're progressing with computers and our ability to persist data and leverage it with machine learning, they're doing the same thing. They're not taking the time to get on the ground and learn about the data on the ground. And they're just drawing random lines and saying that's a country. And I feel that's the conflict that you find in these rooms when you're actually trying to resolve things. Hope that analogy carried forward. <laughs> How many companies do data integrity and data quality correctly? I do not know, short answer. More directly, I've never met one. And the reason why I say that is we have been doing this research. We have been testing it out. We have had POCs to show that it works, but can I name an entire company that when you talk to anybody, that's how they do it? No. Am I aware of companies that there's a team here or there that have heard these presentations and they're like, this is amazing, we're gonna use it? Absolutely. But an entire company, I have not personally engaged. So because this is being recorded, just because I don't know them, doesn't mean they don't exist. <laughs> oh, I misread that. How could they do it correctly? Um, you can call me up as a consultant. <laughs> That's step <laughs> one. <laughs> Give me a call. We'll get you there. I, hey, Raymond, this is Taiko. Thank you for your, your talk today. Um, I, I will say that I'm in, having a consulting background in the financial area. Um, Post-financial crisis with the Dodd-Frank Act, um, there's a lot of regulatory um, forcing of the banks and the, and the industry to adopt this type of a framework. And I would argue that some of those financial institutions are using this exact framework only because, you know, they, they said pre-financial crisis, they had their risk systems in, in order. Post-financial, they were forced to put them in order and, and use this type of a framework. So um, if someone's looking for examples of, of where it's being done, that might be an area to start. Um, but I, I, I would say this real quick. Um, I'm presenting this this way to this audience for a reason. Um, I'm biased because I'm the thought leader pushing this, but I really do feel that I have something here. Yeah, I agree. So what I purposely did, I did not go run the MIT. I did not go run the Harvard. No, nothing against them. The school I'm working with right now has the highest ratio of minority students and they come from the most marginalized areas. I want this camping out. This is an opportunity here. I want this camping out with the people who could use um, this opportunity. This is why I'm working through this organization. This is why I'm presenting to you. Anyone and everyone here who thinks we can get this somewhere, my answer is let's do it. Hit me up, let's make it happen. We wanna get this out there because there is a demand for it. They don't know they want it, but I'm telling you they want it. But I do want um, to change pipelines of who controls something this powerful. I correct. I, I, I agree with you in that this is definitely a, the, the framework to, to go with. My question for you is, um, and building on your theoretical sort of acumen on data, 
what resources did you utilize from to, to get that perspective? Oh, step one, don't have any friends. Step two, read a lot of books. I read anything and everything. And actually, that was step 2B. Step 2A, get out and start tr seeing people and following what they do. Um, as I said, I'm an ex-military. Um, so I, my previous career, it, was, it behooved me to try to learn through instruction or example versus experience. If you think of the three ways you can learn, I don't want to learn what it's like to get shot. I'm okay learning through instruction, not prefer, but if I have to example. So I took that mentality when I came home within the initially the investment within the data space. Um, instead of just listening to how you do it, I listened to everyone how they did it. And I started looking at the patterns, what made sense, what didn't make sense. I saw someone write earlier the five whys. I started asking, I was the person that made people angry because I kept asking, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? So that's really how this all came out. Just a, an initial heuristic approach um, to asking, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And will it actually, what evidence do we have that will get us to where we want to go? I hope that wasn't too esoteric. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think uh, I think that that that's a great reference. I think um, looking for some of the maybe a, a, if there are one or two books that moved you in 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 some sort of way. Oh, oh, you asked the dangerous question to me, my friend. But no, I, I'd say I one can... book, one book that touches yeah. on this: "The Efficiency Paradox" by David Tanner. Start there, everyone. I'm writing in the chat now. I would say start there. You got to start with one book of not just where I got this from, but why. Why did I even bother? Um, oh, sorry. Hold on. I actually said that to just one person. <laughs> um, if you want that information of you know those two questions I just said, um, yeah, appreciate did. that, Raymond. No Thank problem. You for today's talk. No problem. All right. So we are we are a little over time and want to be respectful of everyone's time. But thank you, Ray, for sharing with us today. I think this has been very informative, uh, detailed, insightful. So appreciate you. Uh, to those of you, you look in the chat, I've shared the link to our Tech and Career Talk website, um, as well as the website for our BDPA conference, which will be held in Atlanta in, Atlanta, in, uh, in August. And it will be hybrid this year. So looking forward to seeing some of you there. Uh, but definitely check out the link for our conference. Check out the site for our Tech and Career Talks. You can watch our previous talks as well as the recording for this talk will be available on that website, uh, which will also be on YouTube as well. So thank you. We'll see you again in two weeks. We'll have Raj Davis from Google, from Memory yep, from Google, uh, speaking around some things around cloud. So we're looking forward to that talk. Uh, we'll see you again. Stay safe, stay blessed. Have a good one. Thank you, everyone.